Um, so this session is uh, called first was the code digital rights auditability interoperability and education the DD free software a tool that's a part of an ecosystem so we have explained uh, and told you that when we found ourselves in a situation where there was no um, alternative to the deployment of Google in education and as Zachers say that things should never be sold twice or sold twice there's a lot of things that have already been done in general education as has been said today so we need to call it free software so this is, are the problems that we have tried to have with our Xnet democratic digitalization plan which is to have different parts of free software in a single um, efficiency in a single library that has to be done only once and that can compete against DTEC and in order to do that we need to empower and strengthen everything that we already have uh, before even the arrival of Google and Microsoft so to strengthen what we already have to take it to a new level solving the problems that we have been talking about throughout these days so the problem of auditability software particularly for public services or civil services so that we don't lose control and sovereignty of data and we can only have this with free code or open source code that we can audit institutionally but also um, specifically another problem is usability i repeat to take these tools to the blinking level um, with what you know big tech use with all the colors they use and then interoperability what happens is, well, everything that we've said here throughout these two days, you, the educational community, the faculty, teaching staff, students generate um, a lot of material. You generate it yourselves. And this material, which is your hard work, is captured in a specific tool because that tool does not allow you to import and export so this is another very significant criteria and you see that when we've generated the DD for us it was very important and these people here have solved this with a lot of hard work all this to obtain the sovereignty of data and content so this session is divided into three split into three the first part I repeat we have put together free software open source that is very very consolidated so we have wordpress big blue button etherpad moodle what am i forgetting i think i'm forgetting something kick clock and some others and so the first part we will hear from the people who have invented or generated and who are at any rate administering these tools which are the different parts that make up the DD this comprehensive suite of all these parts so in this first part they will briefly talk these are short interventions at first so they will be talking about all the people who are responsible for these different parts and then here we have the talent that has worked hard to make this possible they have been granted the public tender to put all these parts together and they are already carrying out work in free software and education and free software and data and content sovereignty so very briefly they will explain what they do they will tell us you will be able to get to know other tools and things that they're doing and then we will very briefly show you the famous DD we have been talking for three days no one has seen it yet but it's being used in 11 different sites and we will add two more in September in the city of Barcelona 
that's why it exists for um, there's proof of that I promise and with that oh no sorry and later we have a closing for this session because the Free Software Foundation Europe we have Alexander um, who is a member and consultant for this organization the Free Software Foundation is the reference foundation for free software and we want to close up with that and talk where we're going uh, about where we're going to where we're coming from and um, how we will get there so that will be at the end um, we will now hear from okay discipline please I, I know this is going to be very difficult so please please um, behave yourselves so let's start with the first guest which is a mythological person because we have I hope that we have here with us Martin Dujemas, which is the founder and CEO of Moodle, who will talk to us from Australia. I think it's 10 or 11 p.m., so if we're super lucky. Okay, there we go. We have in there Martin, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Oh, gracias. Uh, hola, everyone. Hi. Um, nice to talk two years just working on the user experience and we've made big changes in how that looks and feels and we continue to do that work um, Moodle 4.1 is coming out a bit later this year and we're working on um, the activities around Moodle it's still more UX work and Moodle 4.2 will have even more UX work so we're really working on the not not so much the features more on the user experience which is really important uh, because moodle competes with a lot of commercial software which is often very simple and feels simple um, but as well as the lms we have a lot of other things and i'll just show you a couple we have the um, moodle academy which is a, a new online course it's in multiple languages and those languages increase uh, are increasing and it's full of free online courses to learn about how to teach online uh, how to administrate a moodle server and also how to develop for moodle as well uh, and that includes certifications too we also recently released MoodleNet, and MoodleNet is our uh, open source solution to curating content so open education resources, and that is connecting all of the Moodle sites in the world because you can put resources in there and take them out. And there's um, the whole, we're building a whole new open source community around this software as well. Um, so it's uh, going very well. A couple of other things that are happening in the community is, uh, oh, this image isn't showing, but we have uh, a new Moodle.org coming soon uh, that's our main community site and it's been a bit looking old um, we have a very big plan to make it uh, very engagement focused we want to make it very easy for anybody to participate in the open source project um, there's the picture um, so it's got a whole new look and feel and it's much more welcoming uh, for everybody uh, Another thing we're doing is we are moving to Matrix. If you haven't heard of Matrix, it is a, an open network for communication. So it's like WhatsApp or Telegram or Messenger or any of those or Teams. Um, but it's a very, very open uh, decentralized method. And it works like email where everyone runs servers and they all communicate with each other. Uh, this is not just a new project. It's been around for quite a long time and it's very mature. It really works. Um, it, it's, it has many clients you can use to, to uh, message with each other. And um, we, ha we are moving our Moodle community, our you know, chat discussion stuff, we're all moving it into Matrix. So if you want to join, uh, this is where you come, hashtag community colon Moodle.com. Um, if you haven't heard of Matrix before, look into it. It's being used by uh, very large uh, players, uh, including governments, 
and uh, in, fully encrypted, very secure, very, very open, and, um, and I, I like it. Now, the last thing I just mentioned here about Moodle is we have a Moodle Moot, a Moodle conference, which is happening in Barcelona in about two months in September. Uh, we're expecting around 750 people. It's a global Moodle conference, and we have people coming from everywhere, including the entire Moodle headquarters team. So we are actually getting around 150 people from around the world from our team to come to Barcelona. So it's a, probably the last chance you'll ever see the whole company in one place and we'll be able to uh, interact with everyone and it's going to be a very exciting conference. So the theme of that conference is about the future. So let's, let me just have a few minutes to talk about things I've been working on for the future and for the next uh, 10 years and plus. So I'm going to go quickly through this and I have a lot more work I could spend hours to talk about, but I'm going to try and be brief. Um, we are moving into a world with a lot of technology changing in a lot of ways. One of the things is wearables. So a lot of the uh, uh, devices that we use for education are going to be all kinds of small devices that we put on our bodies, on our faces. Um, these are all real products, um, augmented reality and virtual reality has, is coming again you know it's come before uh but it it will be a standard thing it'll be as standard as wearing a watch um it'll be uh, the way that you look at the internet you know apple are releasing them meta are releasing them and it's all coming um the internet can look like this uh, you know it, through those uh, augmented reality systems but it's probably going to look a bit more like this where the internet world is connected on top of your real world and it's a very interesting question of, you know, do we want this kind of commercial uh, approach? Do we want uh, proprietary and we want profit focused companies guiding and delivering this experience of our reality? Uh, I think that's something we need to be very careful about, especially when the graphics that are coming to us are of this quality. Actually, you can't tell virtual from real and it really becomes part of our reality. Now, this is already happening. We're looking at screens a lot of the time. Um, and uh, you look at the quality of you know, software like games and so on, they're starting to become places that people live and spend a lot of time in. And um, that's only going to increase. In those worlds, you're gonna see a lot more artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence that's happening now is in getting incredible. I've been following this for 20, 30 years, but in the last one year, the exponential increase in capability is quite stunning. Um, you can tell uh, an AI to write a poem, it writes a poem. You tell it to write some software, it writes software. You tell it to write a web page, it writes a web page. Um, there are so software that's very easy and very cheap that can write an essay for you, an assignment. So in education, if you're assessing your students through assignments and they can create new assignments using a machine, the whole of assessment needs to be um, thought over again um, because these are not copies, these are original. Um, you can also generate photographs of things. This is a generated photograph. And let me show you an example of something I did recently with uh, Midjourney, one of the AIs. So I typed in the word Moodle and it gave me these options. Now they're weird looking pictures, but I picked one that I liked. And then I went through a few more iterations. And after a while, I came out with this cute cow, which we're going to make into a t-shirt. Um, I took some other uh, paths and I came up with this image. I came up with this image. I came up with this Moodle planet. I came up with this other Moodle planet. Uh, here is a Moodle hat in a Barcelona style, uh, Anthony Gaudi tiles. Um, here is a, a woman in VR, a Moodle uh, student. Um, and here is a car made of bamboo, right? And none of those were real. And very recently, I was looking at a news article, and at the top of the article, I spotted these AI images that someone had made because they didn't have a photo of Mark Zuckerberg waving a, a sword, so they just made some. Now, these are very bad quality, but it really makes you think, what is it? What is the, the truth? And who controls the truth now? And where is the ethics in here? Um, 
again, the internet is full of fake information. We have lots and lots of it. We have memes and, and all sorts of imaginary things that are happening. But um, if most of the content of the future, because with AI, you can generate infinite amounts of fake information. Uh, if most of the content, content that comes up in a search engine is fake, is wrong, how do we solve the big problems in life? And so back to our mission, Moodle's here to empower educators to improve the world with the most effective platform for learning. I think the mission of education should be empowering humans to improve the world with the most effective knowledge for action, right? It's education's job to prepare us to live in the future world and uh, particularly in this fake world, we need to know what's real, what is truth, what are the important things. And it's a, a really critical time for humanity. So, you know, say, say no to fake moos. Um, very, very quickly, let me tell you what, I, what, what we're working on, which is open education technology uh, as an association. And you may remember, some of you remember, may remember this conference we had in Barcelona in 2019. Um, the association is coming. Uh, it was a bit slowed down by the pandemic, but it it is coming to help us think on a technical level. What are the what are the standards that we need to be building for a new generation of open ed tech, um, based on W three C and IEEE and open standards? And I have a little map of that system here, and there are five big components. Um, there is an open ed tech cloud that nobody can bring down, like email, right? It, it's something that exists forever and it's, it's free to use. In there, there needs to be a way to curate open education resources so that the, the truthful, the good things, the SDGs, the, 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 the things we wanna focus on in education come to the top, uh, finding the quality there's also room in there for educated classrooms like Moodle, but we're going to be building a new Moodle, a Moodle next generation, which will sit in this cloud. Um, and there's also a learner dashboard, somewhere where learners can have a space for their whole life, um, where certifications and information comes back to. And there's something for organizations as well. I haven't got any time to go any longer about this, but um, in these environments, you will also have AI. So there'll be artificial intelligence working for us, helping us be better teachers, helping us be better learners, um, and helping us run better organizations. And that's how we can build a new infrastructure for education. So if you're interested in any of that, um, come to openedtech.global, the website, or, um, Oh, that's, the screen is not working very well. Uh, you can see here um, on uh, Twitter, you can get Open EdTech and you can find us there. And very happy to talk to anyone or have anyone join if you're interested. So thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Okay, so let's please have the main screen. Right, so another person, a reference person too, we're talking about Frederick Dixon, who is a creator or one of the promoters of Big Blue Button, which is what we are currently using. We have been able to connect with all these people these days using Big Blue Button, not only because Miriam is here, of course, because Miriam is here, that's the essential reason, as a lawyer, she is actually carrying out all the connections, but also because there's this software, Big Blue Button, which is open source and another part of this DD and I don't know whether we can connect already. Do we have Frederick Dixon here? Thank you very much, Frederick, for us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present. I am very happy to be here, and I wish I was there in person, but thanks to technology, I can be part of it for a little bit. So a little bit about myself in terms of the introduction. 
so I'm Fred. I am the product manager for Big Blue Button, and which I'll talk about in a moment, which of course, this is what we're using to present. And I also like to laugh that I moonlight as the CEO of Blindside Networks. And the reason I have these dual roles is there's sort of two halves of the project. Big Blue Button is an open source virtual classroom. We say built by teachers for teachers. And with my other hat on, I am the CEO of Blindside Networks. We started the Big Blue Button project in 2008. And because of the pandemic and a huge amount of growth, we've hosted over 2 billion minutes of virtual classes for over 1 million educators around the world. That's just us, the open source project, lots more. So the way we think of our mission is when the pandemic hit, almost everybody went online and probably almost everyone would agree the teaching experience wasn't the greatest. Uh, it was forced, it was quick, but it did have a, an effect where everybody sort of had a sense where it should be better, it could be better. And so, and this is including Big Blue Button itself, our mission is to build the next generation of virtual classes. And by that, we are not building a video conferencing system. We don't think video conferencing alone is well suited for education. And if we look at the world, we think there's a lot of components of an effective virtual class, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, that is not covered by video conferencing. Video conferences is a component of it, but there's just so much more that has to be done when you think of the world from the view of the teacher and the student. So our world uh, needs a lot of help. Uh, I have the same slide as Martin. This is the sustainability development goals for UNESCO. And one of them is quality education. And so when we think about improving the world, it really means improving education for the world. And when UNESCO talks about education, they look at it as a foundation for achieving a lot of the other sustainability development goals. Like give the world knowledge, give people knowledge so that they can make better decisions. And ultimately we all can live uh, better lives in the future. So uh, the why we do this, and I think I've already said a little bit, we wanna transform lives by improving education for everyone. And that is the entire world. And our way of doing that, and this is sort of complementary to Moodle, is the virtual classroom component. And so how do we do this? Well, we created Big Blue Button. It's an open source virtual classroom built by teachers for teachers. And when we say that, it means that we're not just putting features down, we're really trying to look and understand what a teacher and student are trying to do when they're in a virtual class. So uh, we've spent a lot of time looking at this. And so before I give you any features of the product, let me show you what we think are probably the four most important things for teaching an effective virtual class. And that is management of the class, building relationships with and between students, engaging them for learning and assessing them and giving timely feedback. So we boil that down into basically user stories, set up and manage, building presence and trust with and between students, effectively engage and activate their minds for learning and assess their project progress and give timely feedback. And from these, we think about how we improve our product. And of course the student is there as well. Theirs is a bit simpler. Uh, they need to be in law online participating and feel comfortable doing so. And their goal is to efficiently master new skills. And it's a difference between want and need. They may want to watch a recording at 1.5 times speed and look at TikTok at the same time. That's not what they need. They need to be in the class, making mistakes, applying themselves, and know that the teacher is aware of them, cares about them, and is there to give timely feedback. That reinforces the class. These seven areas are all of what we think about in terms of building out and improving Big Blue Button. So I'll give you just a few thoughts on each one of those. Uh, the setup and management of class, well, that starts with the LMS because that's where we all start. So that means a deep integration. And I have a screenshot here of Moodle and I'm quite happy to say that Moodle built Big Blue Button into the core of Moodle 4.0. And when you think about it, uh, if you said to somebody, hey, um, here's a virtual classroom that's really well integrated with the LMS, but I think it would be better if it was completely separate and knew nothing about the LMS, you would say, that doesn't make any sense. These are two halves of learning. They should be deeply integrated. And that's what we look to achieve, to make it easy for the teacher to set up and manage their classroom for success. Second one is relationships. And that's where video does come important. You wanna build a relationship, you wanna build this trust. So you have capabilities in Big Blue Button to do this. We do videos, no problem whatsoever. 
We have ways of letting you know who's talking. We have ways of pinning the webcam. So that visual component, we've got it covered. The key though is engagement and not engagement for entertaining, but engagement for learning so that the teach students are kind of applying themselves, making mistakes and doing it with the teacher with each, or with each other, um, like in the context of social constructivism. We learn better by working together with each other. Uh, otherwise we would all just watch YouTube videos for four hours and I would be able to speak Spanish after watching it four hours. That's just not how our brains work. So engagement, we built a lot of capabilities in Big Blue Button. Multi-user whiteboards, shared notes, breakout rooms, smart slides, a visual of each. So if I had multiple people in a class right now, uh, pe many people can move their mouse around and I as a teacher would see them so we could collaborate. This whiteboard is built in to Big Blue Button. You don't have to go elsewhere. You also have shared notes. You can collaborate together. So there's a built-in text collaborative area using Etherpad, another op great open source project, doing like key takeaways and it becomes part of the class as well. Again, you're getting students to write, to think and apply. Polling, we made it super easy. It's built in a single click and you can engage. This is formative assessment where maybe you're asking the class, hey, how are things going? Uh, and you wanna be able to do it very easily and have that information available to you. So we make that super easy. We look at the content that you upload and because we already have the text and memory for screen readers, we can actually, Big Black, Big Blue Button can actually see, hey, looks like you have a statement with four slot, four points. Maybe I'll just give you a one button to start a poll. And so the slides actually become more interactive when you upload them into Big Blue Button. An example here, I could do a poll, uh, A, B, C, D with one button. The fourth thing is assessment. And assessment is the point of understanding where students are in their learning progress and helping them out. And the way we do that is when you share slides and engage students with polls and whiteboard, chat, raise hands, they're generating content and that content actually can come back to this teacher during the live class to see who's participating, who's, at, who's in the class, who's participating and who's learning based on responses to polls. So we built out a live dashboard, updates every 10 seconds. It's like this co-pilot that as a teacher's teaching, they don't have to remember, okay, who raised their hand and which slide did they raise it on? Or how did the last poll questions go? We have that information for them. So an example would be, we'll give you a timeline view. We can show you who raised your hands. Again, you don't have to remember this, that information is all there. We'll help you in the class. Last point, it's really important uh, that we built it as open source. So we wanna build a global co a community to achieve our goals. I'll give you two examples of this. Uh, just some stats. Right now, we have over 4,000 members on our mailing list. Uh, over 150 developers have contributed to Big Blue Button. It's localized in over 55 languages. And we're deeply embedded in, in the world's most popular learning management systems. Of course, we really like Moodle. So I'll give you two cases of how this translates into real world benefits. One, during the pandemic, Baden Wuttenberg, a state in Germany, they hosted over 185,000 concurrent teachers and students using Big Blue Button that spanned 3,000 schools running Moodle. They did that all with open source. We didn't learn about it until like six months after they did it. I, really happy to see things like this because it shows me that Big Blue Button enabled them, teachers, to teach students online and save the school year. The second is the French Ministry of Education, the country of France. They're using Big Blue Button very heavily throughout the state and they're moving it into the school systems as well. And they're doing it in a way that they're actually supporting the project. So financially, they're supporting the development of some of the features so that Big Blue Button becomes better for everyone. So in summary, uh, we want to transform lives by improving education for everyone. To do so, we are building the next generation of virtual classes and we've chosen to do it by open source. Uh, I didn't put it here, but I'll actually just put some text. We actually have our own Big Blue Button World Conference happening next week. And uh, it is at world.bigbluebutton.org. I invite everyone to take a look at that site. Come sign up. We've got some speakers from UNESCO. We are building TL Draw, a very impressive whiteboard into the next version of Big Blue Button. We'll be showing that. And we've done lots of work with accessibility and some of the other features that you'll hear us talk about like breakout vision and whiteboard vision. I'll be talking about that more next week. Thanks for the opportunity to share and just share with you our progress in building what we want is the next generation of virtual classrooms. Back to you, Miriam.
si no os importa... Well, if you, if you don't mind, if you have questions for the two of them, as they are connected, we can ask questions uh, straightforward. Otherwise, uh, we can continue. This is up to you. So, do you have any questions for our dear two guests? Yes, we do have a question at the back of the room. You mentioned that the OpenTech um, cloud would be based on Web3 standards, and I was wondering if that was the blockchain term or something else. Yes, yeah, sorry, I couldn't hear the couldn't hear the question. Right. Um, sorry. So I'm. I was asking. Um, there was a slide where the tech cloud. Uh, it said that it was based on Web3 standards, and I was wondering if that was the blockchain related term or, or something else? Uh, uh, one yes, second, uh, Martin, uh, a second, just a second. We grab, if there is some more question, we grab it now. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, okay, go ahead. Questions. Go the, ahead, Martin, go the ahead. Web3, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Web3 does include those distributed federated protocols. Um, blockchain has a lot of baggage. Um, blockchain, the concepts, and th those concepts are the, are the right things. Um, we're not talking about cryptocurrencies. We're talking about uh, ways of storing information in the cloud in a way that it lasts forever. And it doesn't matter if a lot of servers disappear, we still have the data in the cloud. And that's what you need for a lifelong system for students to store their credentials in the cloud. And we don't need to invent all this stuff. There's lots of projects in um, European Union, in uh, um, W3C and others talking about verifiable credentials and wallets. Um, that's the heart of it. But I think we need to build more in, those, in the wallet. I think you need to be able to have services like an AI that gets to know you as a learner and starts helping you with your journey and helps you in your career helps you study on, on Saturday, it knows you have time. So it reminds you, you know, maybe you should work on this, that kind of stuff. Um, those systems are too big to put on a device. They need to exist in the cloud. So we just need to build it in an open way that isn't controlled by large profit focused corporates. The question for them? No? Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, we say goodbye, round of applause. Well. And now we'll uh, continue with uh, Didi, one of the Didi, uh, it's not uh, very well known, it's the Etherpad. Do you know the Etherpad? Well, many of you. We at Xnet, we are only interested in Etherpad, the rest uh, doesn't care. Yeah, for sure, we are living in the Etherpad, basically. So here we have amongst us Peter Rafferty, and he's going to talk about uh, what's the purpose, you have the floor. So, my name's Pete Rafferty, but I just to introduce myself a little bit before we start. So I'm Pete Rafferty. My Twitter handle is Raff31. So if you want to follow me, Raff31. At home with the uh, with the grandkids, I'm Granddad Pete, and uh, I am a primary school teacher. That's where I've spent pretty much all of my career. And although I don't currently, well, I, I the school I'm going to talk about is the school where I've spent most of my teaching career. But I left that school to go part-time about five or six years ago. And now, one day a week, I work at a school up in the part of the UK called the Lake District. And from my house to the school, it's about 120 kilometers. And the school is very small. It's got about 90 children. But there's more animals than there are children. And that's one of the alpacas that live at the school. 
I'm just telling you that, just a bit of introduction. Some other things, and I couldn't, I couldn't come all the way to Barcelona from Liverpool. I'm based in Liverpool. I couldn't come all the way from Barcelona to Barcelona and not mention that when Liverpool played Barcelona in the Champions League semi-final about four years ago, Barcelona won 3-0 at the new Camp, but at Anfield, we scored four goals and we won by four goals to three. And I was at the stadium when the fourth goal was entered, and that's Trent Alexander-Arnold. So that's my introduction, and I couldn't come all the way to Barcelona without saying that. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> it was a good game. Um, now, I'm talking about Etherpad, but I'm not really anything to do with Etherpad. The guy who invented it is that guy called John McClear in the corner. And way back when, when Twitter first started, I used to have regular conversations with John because, being a primary school teacher, at the school in that picture there. So if you see the picture at the top with all of those, I'm very reluctant to say this, all those Chromebooks. All those Chromebooks there. In the background, you can see the PCs that we, the Chromebooks replaced. Now, that picture was taken in 2014. Before we had those PCs, we'd actually bought a set of Windows laptops. And the Windows laptops, it was a significant investment for our school, not a big primary school, quite a small primary school. And when we bought the laptops, we spent all this money. And one thing, as the person kind of like in charge of digital stuff in the school, that I hadn't really thought about properly, common, common thing with me, but I hadn't thought about it properly, was that we then needed to have something and the initial thing was to get uh, Office 2007. But when I asked for a quote about how much it would cost, it was coming to about two and a half thousand pounds, which put us out of uh, buying it. And it was at that moment when I started to delve into the world of open source software to replace the, the stuff that we would have to pay a fortune for. And that's when I came across Open Office, and that was the first thing. Now, for, 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 for the kids in the school, Open Office was a wonderful tool, and they used it straight away with no problems at all. The teachers were a little bit more grumpy, because one teacher said to me, she said, it's all right, but I can't find word art on it. Yeah. Um, but we got by. And it was that initial process of delving into the world of um, open source software that led me to Etherpad. An Etherpad is the best way I can describe it. If you've not come across it before, it was a little bit like Google Docs, but before Google Docs. It's probably the best way I can describe it. And when I introduced it, because we used to, I was in a very lucky position being in school because nobody really knew what I was doing, okay? They knew I was teaching the kids, but some of the tools that I used, they didn't really know much about them. Um, but we tried out things. Some things worked, some things just we tried them and they got left by the wayside. But Etherpad wasn't one of those things. And when we started using Etherpad, and the kids found out that they could create a document and work on that document at the same time in different places in the classroom and sometimes at home, it was a moment, if you've watched Toy Story 1, when Buzz Lightyear goes into the, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, the arcade place and he gets stuck with the, all the little aliens and the claw comes down and as the claw looks up, all the aliens go, ooh. Well, it was the same response with Etherpad with my kids. And my kids at the time were, the eight, and, were eight and nine years old. So they were delving into a world of digital things I would almost say beyond their years, really, uh, and they were experiencing things. And that sort of um, use of Etherpad, um, um, can I just explain, I'm not a techie person. I was looking on the Etherpad website sort of last week, and I came across this phrase right at the top, putting Etherpad behind a reverse proxy, something, something, something. To me, that could be written in Icelandic. I just don't understand what it means. I'm a teacher that uses digital stuff, Etherpad being one of them, okay? Now, Talking yesterday, this just uh, the use of Etherpad, the use of Open Office, and the use of trusting children at school with digital tools kind of like led from one thing to another. And if we can just go to the next slide just for one minute, um, it sort of, it, they, 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 the, 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 the eight and nine year olds at the time in my class were doing things sort of beyond their years, as I said before. 
And one day we had this girl, uh, this teacher come in. Her name is Zoe Ross. And at the time, um, 2011 this was, so it's just a couple of years later, but it was the culture of open source technology which developed this kind of thing. And she came in and she watched my class, who at the time were doing a lot of work with Etherpad, yes, but also a lot of work with WordPress blogs that we also had. And she came in and she watched um, a little boy called Kyle talk about editing HTML code. And she was stunned. And at the time, she was writing a piece for a quite an eminent online publication called The Purpose of Education. That's what she was writing about. And she had this blog post for that thing already in set. And she came into our class, listened to the kids talking about their stuff, and she um, changed the blog post. It, if you read through that, it says, yesterday I visited a group of eight and nine-year-old children taught by me at Green Park School. I came home and deleted everything. And it was really good. And it relates to what um, the guy from Barcelona City Council was talking yesterday about. Because in, it, in his talk, he mentioned about how students should contribute to the world of and dis, help to decide what things are done and how it's done in their classrooms and things like that. And it struck a chord. Because when this article was written, it was written for in the UK, very eminent, em, 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 eminent and important people. And those eminent and important people left comments on the blog post. And you can see right at the top, there's 33 comments, okay? Of it, kind of like important people in the world of education technology, very important. And then, if we go to the next slide, Lily joined in. At 7.37 p.m. on March the 2nd, 2011, she said to Zoe, Dear Zoe, thanks for coming into our class to talk to us. I hope you enjoyed coming in. I also hope that you can come again. If you come in again, could you show us more computer skills? Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Bye from Lily in year four. And it, for me, it was a wonderful moment because it had a little year four... And by the way, the way I was talking about Lily, that's the way Lily talked. She was very bright and very bubbly. But it was a, an eight year old joining in, in an adult conversation in a sensible, very orderly way. And it also, we didn't have any trouble with these safety difficulties because these were kids living, kids living in a grown up world with, you know, with the right kind of attitudes because we built them in to go back to things like Open Office, to things like I, um, Etherpad and to things like the WordPress blogs that I think somebody might be talking about afterwards. But it, it sort of so, so that's my story of how we used Etherpad, but how Etherpad then developed our digital skills, students' digital skills, and that's how we use them. And I was supposed to have five minutes. Am I five minutes up? We would like to see an expert. Oh, sorry, right. So go back to the first one. Go back to the first one. First slide. So if you... If, are you going to an open one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Dot com. Uh, yeah, should I repeat the thing? Yeah. Uh, so I'm creating this uh, Etherpad called xnet.22. It's under code etherpad.com. Basically, what people would do would be send this uh, URL directly, and uh, people can join here and write things. So I'm writing this from my phone right now. But and it's black. What is well, this? What I don't know. That, that's the theme the that the theme. thing has. Eh? It's, it's a black. theme. Okay. Yeah. You can have it in white. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can be white uh, and pink if you like it or rainbow colored. Uh, it's pretty. So the nice thing is I'm writing this from my phone. And if you open the same link, you could do the same thing. And when the kids uh, from RAF saw this, that's when they went, oh, the hook. Yeah. Uh, it's it, was, it, was, it was a proper moment of... Um, you know, kids in a grown-up world recognizing how they... And, you know, it was fascinating because I know that they used it in school, but they also went home and used it because they knew that they could. And they were coming up with projects of their own about pop stars and this, that, and the other. And it was just great to see, you know. And they involved me. I used to get notifications to say, here's another project, here's another project. Fabulous. Fabulous tool that's easy to use, and it's free, and it makes sense. So that's yeah. my talk about Etherpad. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yes, it's a very light system, and this uh, version, it's a very fashion version. 
It's a collaborative uh, model, very light, much more uh, lighter. It's lighter than a Google Doc, and uh, many people can write the color of uh, the person that wrote. Uh, you can see who contributed, and uh, we use it uh, since the beginning of the. Because if you have, uh, you can write it in white, and if you need to change some words or something, immediately you can see who contributed. It's much more agile. Uh, than uh, Google Docs or other uh, systems or other online documents despite uh, being uh, free. Uh, so, uh, well, three of the main and the key uh, pieces of uh, DD. Slowly we'll get to DD. And uh, once we talk about the democratic digitalization plan has to consist in having this uh, suite. You are logged in in a collaborative uh, form. It open in the classroom. You can use Etherpad. You can use it in the classroom and also in the cloud. And you are constantly uh, in touch and communicating like uh, big tech tools. So in this sense, uh, as a part of the project, we asked to the municipality to adopt the uh, tender and how to develop uh, the uh, software that puts together all these parts. And uh, this uh, public tender uh, has been kind of uh, complicated, but uh, little by little, they were able to detect local talent. And uh, I'm going to introduce the people that worked in uh, DD Code, because they want, I want them to introduce who they are. And now we'll have Alberto Larraz from Isard Vidi. Isard VDI. Well, I come from Isard VDI, and we collaborated in the first part to develop the first part of the tool, as Simona mentioned. And I'd like to share with you what do we do? You see, open source virtual desktops. That's what we do. We want to virtualize desktops. This is uh, the core activity that we develop. Well, the project uh, began at the Professional School of Barcelona. The teachers and system administrators there, they needed a tool that didn't find in the market. Software was uh, created in 2014. It was presented in Red Iris, Fossum, and Open Expo. After the pandemic, uh, they had already the desktop and the civil servants of the Catalan government, they need help. And uh, we created the remote uh, working system for teachers. And uh, suddenly, we uh, wanted to create this uh, company, ISART. And our company offered some support and uh, developed the different open source solutions that we created. Nowadays, our software. Uh, it will be in 75 centers of uh, professional uh, education. We are also in Aragon with a GPUs uh, project. GPUs, uh, they really need. And uh, it is a, a computer. And if you have students that really need this kind of software, it is a way to democratize the access. And we are also in Euskadi and in the Basque Country. So it's an open source uh, system and software. It's uh, so gratifying when people tell you that they are installing this uh, software all over the world and they are asking you questions. So we feel very proud. Very quickly, let me. OK, this is Isart. And uh, you can have a Linux or Windows desktop. You open uh, your desktop, and inside a browser, you can have a Windows, or inside a uh, browser, you can have Ubuntu. You can serve the web. And this is a tool that it's really interesting for uh, teachers. Well, why are we showing Windows here? We live in a real world. We'd like that little by little to convince people to only work with open source uh, software. But they, with a tool like ours, you can uh, work 
and you can uh, create a desktop with Ubuntu and to have all the tools that a teacher needs. You can also work it with Linux or also a professional teacher, I don't know, with a print or a plotter that the prints things can interact with Windows. Why not? We must get adapted to the reality of things. Okay, let's carry on with my presentation. Val. Doncs, per què què ofereix la solució? Nosaltres el que oferim és una alternativa so, what is the solution? We offer a VDI, a virtual uh, desktop infrastructure. So this is what we offer, and uh, always uh, putting at the center the education system. Well, we were also teachers. We already tested uh, some solutions in our classrooms, and we created a tailor-made uh, tool that really it's very competitive uh, against Citrix, uh, VMware, uh, Horizon, or Azure that are not thought to be in a classroom. So we uh, offered some solutions for this educational uh, system. And also, we have other solutions for different sizes. And because sometimes uh, big corporations do not think about small schools. So we are working together with the uh, Catalan government, offering loads of services. And the idea, it is to work in different uh, schools. We also uh, test it in a Brazilian school and software. It's uh, working very well there. And uh, what else? Very quickly, uh, what are the uh, teaching advantages? Students from home, they can use the same tools that they have in school. This is kind of uh, complicated because in school you have to use some software and this creates a kind of a digital and also the desktop, they are always in a desktop and all the work, uh, something that uh, common and how to control the user's desktop, so we can control everything. And we can see what students are doing and also we can follow up how students are working with different desktops they can be in a classroom or at home. What I really wanted to share with you is that we have the software development control. If we ask it for this kind of things to a big company, they will never do it because it will be useless for them and non-beneficial for just a single teacher. And also bearing in mind if we have a future needs to us, the open source software, it's very interesting. And it's very cool to us. Uh, so I'm a teacher uh, in a high school in Catalonia, writes us, why don't you put the button here or there? And this kind of interaction together with teachers and developers will allow us to develop a much more uh, adaptable uh, and adapted uh, software. Well, what about my time? Do I still have time? OK, just a second. Després, com connectem escriptori remots? How can we connect remote desktops or virtual desktops that are inside a very powerful server? So let's imagine that there is a machine that costs 12,000 euros, a uh, lot of money. And we have there all uh, students' desktops. How are they connected in a virtual classroom? We get connected through virtual networks. There are several options in order to make possible to work with these virtual desktops in a real environment. So a 3D printer that is not connected in our high school because nobody is going to work with it. Well, we can leave it connected at night and someone from home can use it through the virtual desktop. So we made quite a big effort to get connected with physical classrooms and virtual desktops. Each and every teacher changes the model and how to teach and when we teach technology, right? Because if I offer you Windows or Ubuntu, you have Ubuntu and you can install whatever you want. So we are offering some freedom to teachers because the teacher can install the software that he really wants and he uh, has like a blueprint that can distribute to students and uh, students can alter and change the blueprint. We are also incorporating inside Moodle and uh, we have a plugin that will allow us to get uh, connected with other e-learning tools. 
And there is another advantage because from the school perspective, uh, well, we also have to make very big efforts to uh, for the maintenance of the computers and so on. So, Thanks to this system, each and every student can uh, have a tailor-made desktop and also mobility because you can have your computer connected to a virtual desktop. I can be at the teacher's office, I can go to the classroom, I can go home. Uh, the ability to get on the move and we also can save a lot of money because it's also green friendly because uh, the consumption of a computer for uh, four uh, years plugged in for four, uh, 24 hours a day, it is the same cost uh, when we produce these computers. So the fact of uh, changing software has a very important impact. So if we are able to have this useful, it's kind of an advantage. So for example, now, we have uh, coordinators from uh, eight years ago. They are very, very small. And well, in the end, you get connected and you have access to the website and you can work from there. This is another advantage that we can see. And also to recycle old uh, teams here in, uh, in SCADI. In the Basque Country, we had 3D exams and three models to be connected um, and also we have different elements connected to the main screen and uh, we can move uh, th th through 3D because you cannot move the computer where you can find the whole hardware and we can see that this is what we can do. If you want to get in touch with us, we are in HitLab. The idea is for this to be easy to install. You can try to install your software in your computer if you have Linux and a bit of not. Try it out. And also we would like to finally claim the fact that there is a fabric of companies or people, as you will now see, that go for this open source software, which is also very much needed and there's not so many projects and we believe that this point of proximity and generating local economy. This is something that we want to give value to, too. I don't know whether you can understand what I'm saying or not, but um, yes, you can think about doing things. Um, alternative to virtualization, for instance, that seemed complex, but here we are fighting. And how do we um, earn our living? Well, through the different installations, support, and helping for different centers and sites to be able to assemble the solution they want. And that's basically my presentation. OK, you will see that gradually we see uh, the amount of talent that we have here and how public tendering goes to mega things that not, are not Catalan, Spanish, or even Europe. So anyway. We now move on to the next speaker, Bauplana from Tresipun, who were the first to is at VDI and Tresipun won over the first Tordic Tender of DT and they started the development. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, in all the languages I know. <laughs> I don't know Swedish, I'm sorry. Okay, that's, that, that's about it. Okay, thank you. All right, in case I forgot any languages, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for the translation. Guys, they've said good afternoon 20 times, but I will now start. Anyway, I'm Pau Plana, co-founder of Tresipunt. We are three partners, and this is a development company that started in 2004 as a company of development of open source software. We try to take existing tools in the market and adapt them to the projects that we find. We are a service company. We don't have a product such as Izard. And well, just to summarize, we're Moodle partners. We are pretty much involved in LMS Global, which is one at Tech now. Uh, we're also part of the EduTech cluster from the 
very beginning, actually, and we like to think that we do um, IT craftsmanship. We try to find a way to adapt what our, to a, what our clients need. So as I said, we started in 2004. In 2008, we started collaborating with the UOC, University, and we went towards e-learning. Since 2017, we're Moodle partners, and currently we are loads of things in this 2022. So these are the projects that we have. These are reference clients, but I believe that in this case, I would like to stress all these. We especially work with universities, with educational centers, and sites. We also work the part of teachers, teacher trainings uh, with maristas in the Mediterranean, for instance, the entire training platform for teachers and, and content and design um, creation, well, has been done collaborating with them. We have also been very lucky to work in projects such as, well, from UNESCO um, in um, mapping ecosystem mapping environment for education. We are now implementing this in Ghana. And also with different publishing companies, we work with uh, on, on standards so that they can take their contents to all different platforms of the sites as long as they use standards. Google Classrooms, for instance, doesn't use uh, standards. They use their own standards. Um, and also we have a project with the EU uh, with the climate kick parts, we have done a course on awareness raising on climate change for children. This is content generated by the EU. It's totally open and can be checked up. Any school or site can register, enroll, download the content, and it's a very well-made course. And I believe it's rock working really well. This is the second year we've done it. We came from our proprietary platform. We were straight jacketed with what it offered and we have assembled a Moodle platform, Moodle Workplace in this case that allows them to um, get 12 countries, I believe we are in the EU. For instance, the uh, IED, this is a design institute. I would also like to talk about Moodle with them. These are mostly Moodle projects, although we do touch other tools too, as WordPress or other open source tools. And the idea of, well, all of them being so ugly, difficult to use, maybe that's because you don't have the appropriate partner. Here I am. Hello, hello. So with IED, we have changed the visualization totally in Moodle. Middle visualization is very important, so we modified everything. It's all about the project being well thought through and adapting to each and everybody's needs. Moodle, the good thing about open source, and we like working on it so much, it, there's the personalization. It's totally extreme if you want. You can... Um, assemble and disassemble the parts of the software that you're interested in and you can strengthen them and those you're not interested in because the project doesn't want them you can just you know forget about them this allows us to do very interesting projects and throughout the years there are some of which we are very proud of for this and other reasons last year Moodle considered us to be the partner with the most open source contributions. And I wouldn't say the world, but amongst the partners. And this is something, uh, well, an award I, I like to talk about. And after talking about ourselves so much, our story about, with Didi, with Maris and um, Simona, we met tech, some talks that were uh, organized in 2019. Lots of companies got together, open source uh, companies, and there was Fred and Martin and other companies, open source companies too. And the idea was to think about why the open source tools, there are some that are best and more possible. Etherpad, for instance, it's much easier. It has proven to be much easier than Drive or um, Moodle that can have uh, much more power to adaptation than a classroom. Um, because really, depending on what sectors or fields, it was difficult to put projects forth. So 
we thought about this for a long time, everyone was trying to contribute, and at the end of the day we determined this, that basically it's lacking sex appeal. Um, open source is all fine and well, but for the user it needs to be easy, it needs to be well, we changed to we need to change this mindset of it being complicated, and the idea was to think uh, about how we could do this. Simona and Maria have been thinking about this for a long time, but finally, in two thousand and twenty one I think that was the first public tender end of twenty twenty we started working and we got the funding for the project. During 2019 and 2020, we thought about what tools to use and how to get there and everything that we managed to do. So we started the project. This is a PDF, um, but these were us doing this. Anyway, the situation of the project now, the condition is that we are on our pilot project now. Writing it in 11 sites, two more in September. We've done the deployment. It's fully deployed. and. Um, there's a couple of tools we need to do the trainings and we hope this is the beginning of a project that is here to stay and to improve um, the world of education. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, one of the things that I was saying before is that there's a lot of talent here and with all the work that this entails, more and more teams of people have been added to the project because redoing this was not enough and it wasn't easy. More and more people, the project continues um, looking for talented people because we have more and more work than what we can actually take on in the 24-7. So we are generating demand in that sense, and we're still lacking people. So these are work positions, etc. So the next people coming in, Andres and Madi. First, we will hear from Andres. He is member of EXO. Expansion, expansion, open network. So you have the word. You have the floor. Simona just gave a spoiler. I was going to say, "Hey, Andres, I'm called um, Evelham on the internet. So what? This is the first question." EXO means Association for the Expansion of Open Network. We are an association in the city of Barcelona. As such, we are part of the social economy fabric, and I hope this is something transforming. This is something I learned from the Basque colleague yesterday in the city. So this was created in 2007. It's a non-profit organization, and it has no salary mass. So the part of the open network in the EXO name is that we are a registered telecommunications operator in Spain. In order to do a certain amount of things, you need to be registered in whatever place. I don't know about those things. And we are also members of Catnix. Those of you who know how the internet works, this is a neutral point of internet for you to have an idea. This is a place where several internet providers can say, hey, I'm interested in connecting with you so that traffic is a bit more uh, or less expensive. So it's like, um, putting a thread between two points, also we're members of RIPE. I will explain this too for those of you who don't know it. This is an administrative body on the internet and they're in charge of administering all the part of IPs in the European space. And one of the most relevant ones, that that's why we were EXO in 2007, is that we are part of QuifiNet. This is a project that basically covers the uh, all the idea of the open 
free and neutral network. What does this mean? Well, this is a network where anyone can connect and interconnect. My colleague Pedro from EXO can give you more details later if you have any questions. And there's different ways of interchanging or exchanging traffic between operators. And particularly back then when EXO and Gifinet was born, there were many towns that didn't or were internet connections didn't reach, like Movie Star, for instance, or Telefonica didn't reach there with fiber optic cables. So one things that one thing that was done is to put antennas. This is an antenna, as you can see here. So on the other side of the antenna, there is another antenna. And these two antennas are facing each other, and it's like having a cable. And this allows us to take internet connectivity to places where it will normally reach. It's quite cheap to install because we don't need to use cables. It works pretty well. And this is something that is being done for a long time. When I say here, I mean Catalonia in general. This is a fairly well-known project worldwide. So amongst other things in EXO, we do lots of things. It's a very difficult to describe project. Um, but this is an internet connection service. Uh, through radio. So, as more and more connections are added, we started needing a digital infrastructure. This means some servers and places where to do the interconnections, etc. And this, therefore, the digital infrastructure of the association grew. So, throughout time or when time passed by, this um, changed, of course, this is a node we have in the city of Barcelona, and now it is a um in Barcelona. This basically means it's a data center in Barcelona. This is infrastructure that, well, EXO couldn't afford or couldn't pay for, but we shared with other entities who also need um, the use, and we have some rights to use depending on what things. EXO is in charge of administering the physical parts and the software parts, so has a certain percentage of use. All this, since we now have a connection with a data center, and this means that it's a truly good connection, we are interconnected with everyone, so we can offer um, optic fiber, and we do this with third-party physical networks. Oh, I skipped over this one, but I wanted to show you this photo, the explanation of why we use third-party uh, fiber. This is Barcelona. This is a photo of a uh, piece of news of uh, Canon Commission of Audiovisual Media. And the title was Cables Are Damaging Heritage. So here we can see two, three, four boxes of fiber optic cables. This would not be necessary in a country with uh, good regulation or a city such as Zurich, for instance. I'm thinking about, I'm not talking about capitalist things. Zurich has their own fiber uh, optic fiber. They have just one belonging to the city and it's offered to the different suppliers and providers. You don't contact with the city, you contact with the provider and they pay the deployment and connection of optic fiber with the city council. So that's why we use third-party physical network. We couldn't afford otherwise. We are a non-profit association and we couldn't do this, as I said, but we can provide access to optic fiber through this. Apart from this, we do social projects too. Maybe you are familiar with these. Um, no student without internet. This is a project in the area of Mataró, where there are some access points for people who have some student credentials and they can access internet wherever there is uh, an access point. Also, throughout the pandemic, we did several programs of taking connectivity to vulnerable families. One of the most important projects of the association is the uh, Barcelona Community Radio Network. And we participate a lot in open source uh, 
tools and we do many more things that's why I wrote many more things because it's they're difficult to explain apart from this this is also a community EXO is a community to share knowledge to experiment with technology and it's a support human network and it's all moral and technological when thing you need someone who needs a, a, a professional hands that you can talk to a person and they can help you out. So how have we participated in DD with the big blue button? I won't explain because of course um, our colleague CEO from the company already did essentially developing the big blue button. We are in version 2.5, 2.4, sorry, 2.5 is too recent. We haven't done the update. Why? Why did this make sense? Well, as Simona was saying, we're lacking uh, time and hands, human hands, to do things. And in EXO during the pandemic, maybe a bit before that even, with the initiative of Pedro, we started experimenting with this type of platforms. We assembled our big blue button. We have it in a data center in Barcelona. For video calls, it's not what Big Blue Button does, all of it at least, but it's a significant part. So the physical location was important, the information needs to travel, and it's limited by, well, the speed at which uh, things can, can move. So it's important, the fact that it's in Barcelona. Very useful for schools in Barcelona. So we have a totally automatized um, management of Big Blue Button. It's also very useful because this means that a series of personalizations that were detected as needed for schools. Uh, well, not only schools have benefited from this, but many more instances can be built with exactly the same configuration and setup. It's very interesting. And towards the end of the project, of the DD project, we started only with the big blue button, but towards the end, I don't know whether anyone has done a big project here, I'm sure, but things always happen in a big project, don't they? And there are things that you just leave uh, until the end. And so we have done a general review. We've done, um, well, some training to show you the, co the code for the audience and to improve installation too, improvements of the installation. So thank you very much um, for all your presentations for here online and in person. Here you can check our different links and whenever you leave this place you can go to EXO and enroll and register. We do really nice things. Thank you. Finally, we have Madish, Madish, with myself and other colleagues, is founder of Ixnet, and for a long time in Ixnet, she is the only one who knows about technology, and we are a reference organization. And well, obviously, Maddox had to be in charge of the entire X. Xnet uh, infrastructure. Many people were requesting help, and so she started helping more and more and more people. This was just too big for her in the end, and she had to open her own company called Maddox. And she's the boss and CEO of Maddox, uh, totally independent from Xnet. So Maddox has also contributed. She, well, she has now been involved in DD2. She was not in the part of DD development, but she will explain this better. You have the floor. Thank you, Simona. Well, yes, this coincidence, Madis Madix, is because I'm not too imaginative, as you can imagine. It's not just anything else. It's not that I love my name or anything. Um, it had to be provisional, but no, we had other things to do, of course, so that's how it stayed. Anyway, saying. Um, this project, which has been uh, operating since 2019, was born because we detected the lack of... We, we were working a lot with the activist field, as Simona was saying before. We didn't know the first thing about education. Um, but in the activist field, we did detect that the people who were preparing campaigns and also working with data, so sensitive data even, they were using the, well, the evil tools, let's say, 
the big corporations and we were telling them hey no you can't do this and they said all right fine so what should I do and we were like okay I don't know fine <laughs> well we, we didn't say I don't know but you should set up a server install this install that it was just you know true hell so anyway they came me and they came to me and said well can you do this for me and I had no more time left so I thought well we need to solve this let's have an automated system that can be developed just once and that can cover lots of people in needs so that's how we started this and essentially there's I don't know whether you can read this or not but I will explain it there was a lack of well email that was basically it there's lots of open source software out there and well one thing is that it's there but then you have to enable the infrastructure so that it works with maintenance security etc but then there is another topic in Spain no one really wants to manage emails it's not that it's complicated to uh, put it together but then there's spam then there's I have too much spam now I don't have the emails I don't get them now um, I I'm not sending my emails this is the problem so Maddie do offer email uh, service because well we are a bit anxious about this slide anyway I don't know whether you can read it or not but there's Google Gmail there then there's Yahoo this is quite old because I'm sure that Yahoo would be further down but anyway the important thing here is that Gmail is the uh, email that is used the most and the blue line indicates the youngest people this means that the trend of this graph to be more differentiated even is well as we can see it's growing so with Gmail if you offer email once you're logged in you are within this great world and you're identified all along and coming out of this is much more difficult so it's very important that there is a way of being able to manage your own email so our philosophy to do this was not to have an alternative to Gmail because well look at this this is a list but an incomplete list basically of companies that are mm, belong to Google basically I didn't really know how to fill the screen we, we can see this is just huge it's not a comprehensive list and this is also old so I'm sure it's even greater and bigger and longer so the idea was not to have an alternative to Gmail but the same technology philosophy was well you delegate things on me and I will I'll be in charge of everything then Gmail comes along tomorrow and buys me and then I have to start again from scratch right so the philosophy with which we've built Maddox is that the person can be not only proprietor of their own data but also of the tool of the software and this can only be done with open source so what Maddox does is offer or facilitate the installation process and is transparent in the sense that people when they use Maddox can access as super admins and super gods to their entire infrastructure no secrets there what I am saying here can be proved this is not just you know a black box of any kind so this favors if I die tomorrow because I mean I will travel I will be traveling on a plane next week so if I die what happens then no you will still have your own thing and you think well she's died by still we can install it somewhere else without having to have this migration of data structure S there's one thing about all this all is fine and well but before I said that we use some automation tools 
if I have some time, I don't know whether I will or not, maybe I'm talking too much, but the automation has a problem to it, at least for what we wanted to achieve. What we want to achieve is to offer this to you and make things easy. Do not want to have access to your data. They're yours. I don't want to access. So this automation systems are a bit invasive in that sense because you do need to access the systems in order to be able to set it up, etc. So we have turned this around and we've used very solid technology. We have not invented anything, but we have turned it around, turned the implementation around so that we don't need to have access to the data or the servers that we provision. It's the servers themselves, let's say they're the clients, who are using their repository and that way they can download the recipe for the version, the recipe for the update, etc. This is just for you to understand what we use and the technical flow of how this works. And this would be the interface. We have developed a graphic interface that allows for all this to happen. So installing things, maintaining the server, there are some apps here. We have around 20 available apps. There are some there and many more. Anyway, we service, as I was saying before, companies too, yes, but activist groups. So security, which is always a concern, is an even greater concern. So we did a security audit, but an internal one. So we have been analyzing everything uh, from the very inside. It, it was not trying to penetrate the system, it was done from within. And we love this because this has allowed us to not only solve some problems and do troubleshooting, but also have security backups uh, of things that were needed and missing. So now we're totally shields in terms of security. And we also offer the update not only of applications, but the entire operating system. You know that the operating system, you go from Windows 9 to 10 or Debian 9 to 10, whatever. And this is a lot of work. Of course, you need to take many things into account, but this is also included in our mechanism. And well, this is where we are. This drawing, I love it because it means that we're continuously working. Uh, you do understand it, don't you? This continuous development and all the settings you know are turning around all the time. And I think that's all I had to say. Oh, no, 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 just one thing. Sorry, sorry, one important thing. Well, there's GitLab here. That's where you find all the code that we produce. It's also open available for everyone and we hope this is something that can continue as a trend and regarding DD well you guess we do the email of DD what no one else wants to do okay obviously yes and that's it thank you And, uh, you know, naturally, as XNet is a design part and the creation of this uh, digitalization plan, we did it with uh, Maddox, and uh, she said, I'm be there, but I don't want to do anything. I'll help you. I'll help you to design, but please, I don't want to be engaged because I have too much work, and, uh, well, in reality, you know, what we've said yesterday, there is kind of an atrophy of our brain. Uh, Gmail, it's for free. So there are no uh, companies working in this sense. It's very difficult to find voluntary people. And uh, Maddox, uh, for a few months, she's with us and she also part of DDD. 
And after talking about so much about Didi, I, we want to share you. We want to share with you because we do have a video. And because, you know, my doubt is to make this connection work. I don't know why happened that streaming is not working anymore. So if we cannot uh, show it live, uh, yes, we'll do it live. Otherwise, we have the video clip to share with you. Well, I want to share with you very rapidly uh, the tool. And uh, finally, I'll share with you the Okay, hello again. What a responsibility after listening to you all guys. Come on, I try to make my best anyway. Well, here I'm going to talk a little bit about theory and uh, later on you'll see how this tool works. I want you to have a global idea of the project. DD is an educational workspace that was created inside the digitalization democratic XNet framework, so on and so forth. Blah, blah, blah. What are the main tools? Here you have it on the screen Moodle, WordPress, only Office, uh, Big Blue Button, Nextcloud. Also the email, yeah, the email, yeah, that's, I had to say, I had to say it. Well, hmm. That's a kind of tricky. Anyway, um, everything was installed with Docker's and so on. The idea was the next one. The idea was to make this uh, work in a very solid manner, very robust, uh, very agreeable, friendly, use, user friendly. And uh, the work that we did together with XNet, together with Cecilia, and we wanted to uh, detect all the users' and teachers' needs, and many schools were engaged since the beginning of the project. So we wanted to detect the needs and to offer something very useful, taking advantage of the existing tools. Yes, right. I, uh, that's uh, Please, microphone on, otherwise we cannot translate. Please, mic. Simona, mic. We need the mic. Ah, oh, OK. Oh. Anyway, we always say the same. We don't want you to learn what you already learned. This is not sustainable. That's why uh, from uh, the design department, we made a huge effort for the learning curve uh, to be easy. Uh, so we don't want you to uh, suffer a lot because we uh, were scared and we were convinced that we had to uh, leave behind the big techs. But now, you know, after the pandemics, to create a new tool and to learn about this new tool, so we made a big effort from his side and all the members of the team to get adapted for you to have a very low learning curve, very easy to learn. Well. We had five main goals. Single authentication, we are using many different tools. Uh, well, we don't have to remember all the passwords. Single login and you get in. And also we have a menu uh, to have access to all the apps. You don't need to remember your address, uh, direct links, no. You have a menu that includes everything. You can change your logo, you can change the colors, the buttons, the links, the URL, everything. What about the management of tools? This is something that really worried you. So we make things easier. We wanted to make uh, things easier for all the people working with this tool. And uh, the final one, in order to have a very powerful tool, it has to be uh, created in a manner to make the system scalable for everybody and uh, people from the West country if they want it for them well they will have it and they will install it in all the schools and high schools well we'll see what happens yes it's possible it's very easy to implement in other schools and high schools what are the main features well the features was to um, improve user experience if we want to be successful, it must be easy to learn, easy to implement, easy to use, and the learning curve must be very easy. So the data access is uh, a single one, 
access all the services. They have the same identification system. Deployment has to be very, very simple. We use Query and Compose. Uh, our dear friends from ISART, they made a huge job in the beginning. And another very important uh, theme that is very important to us has to do with security. Well, a proprietary tool, you know that it's there always, and uh, well, uh, they uh, share data, and we had to protect data, and the open source data, this is kind of something that really worried us. So all the systems should be monitored, should be uh, secured, and two things that we created, together with Izard, that were created because they didn't exist at all, the centralized user uh, management, each and every one of these uh, parts. If we wanted to manage everything from a single place, if you want to change the password, if you want to change the, the app colors, if you wanted to change the teams, we had this uh, management, uh, user management. The most interesting thing is that you can create your own groups, such as the classrooms, and they can be replicated with all the tools that you created. Since you have a group that you want to share something through Nextlook, it's like the Moodle. So if you change the user, you can have the centralized tool. You don't have to repeat it infinitely. And also the uh, personalization of the environment. You can have the same logo everywhere. We have the upper bar the background images, the corporation colors, so we had to make it uh, personalized. So this is the theoretic presentation, and now let's see the practical presentation. All right. Let me, okay, let me try. This is the login, right? Just a second. I don't know what microphone to use. Well. The logo that you can see in the upper part is, is the XNet, but this is the logo that we were talking about. The colors, the shapes, right? No, well, no, we don't have XNet. No, no, no. We don't want to put XNet everywhere. We don't want that. But the XNet logo, uh, you can put whatever logo you wish. You can put your school logo, your community logo, and you can change the colors. Uh, our color, it's like um, violet, but you can also uh, change the background of the screen. Yes, and in this specific case, the domain is a three i dot, but you can change whatever. You can put your school uh, domain. Okay, I'm going to get in as a teacher because uh, this is what really interests you. And now. Okay, it took too long to open, yes, no. Oh gosh, no, it's just a security issue. Because if you click on login, I have to refresh the page and if, uh, well, he detects, the system detects that you took too long to write, it tells you that it should be faster. Sorry, I knew that's always the same life problems anyway. So, um, well, what do we have here? This is the main portal, which is the classroom. I wrote in the URL Moodle dot whatever. If I had written uh, uh, email whatever, I would have written the email or documents, I would uh, share with you the documents. But here you have uh, some classes. These are fake classes. I want you to See how it works. As Simona said, this is the logo that you can change. You can put your own logo. We have this responsive menu. The screen is smaller. You can change the element distribution. And here you have the menu I was talking about. This uh, allows us to get access to some tools. And if you know of the some one of the, some of the tools, uh, well, it's uh, not by chance. You have the forms, the chat, the calendar, websites, and many other things that are very interesting. And also, big Robertson meetings because we, have, but also we can have uh, meetings with our parents and uh, kids' parents. Sorry, what are you saying, Simona? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, I forgot that. Yes. We have six elements, and you can include any kind of URL. 
you have the uh, school website, YouTube access, Wikipedia. So those elements that you use the most in a classroom, uh, you can uh, thank you, Simona. Thank you for uh, and uh, this uh, for the end. This is kind of important. And for each and every classroom, you can see that I'm the teacher. How many students do I have? If I have a, a comment, uh, how to access uh, to the classroom? If I were a student, I will appear like a student. Something that we personalized, uh, taking into account teacher's perspective. I have these two buttons here because I'm a student and a teacher. And this offers me access to all the tasks that must be assessed and rendered, right? So we have all the tasks and different courses, different tasks, different homework uh, that my students uh, gave to me and everything they have to correct and to assess and to evaluate. So it has the same power as Moodle has. If I had tasks to make, well, I will open the cloud. In this case, we have the same course. I will have uh, direct access to the next task. And uh, courses can be filed, and we can include it in the uh, folder that you want. And uh, in Moodle, you have to click many, many times. But here, we only have a single button, new course, and uh, you can write low course and I can select category that are available I can decide to make it visible or not because maybe as I don't have uh, already the content it's much better to not to show and to make it not visible I can create a class or the course and the subject and it's already created here you can see the basic structure of the course it is a straightforward link, direct link to the virtual classroom with uh, some contents and general advices and different folders that I want to share with you later on. So you can see that in order to create a course, it took me a few seconds. And the virtual classroom creates the uh, blink blue button link straightforward and automatically. So each and every uh, class by default has got this bleak, uh, blue button link. Well, let's go to a course subject. OK, what are the elements, the structure of the course? As I'm a teacher, I can edit. I have an access to edit the course. I can duplicate it uh, because I do have this course this year. If I want to create a new course for next year, I can start from scratch or I can copy paste. I can erase the course. I can click on that and I can erase the course. Inside the course, I have four uh, folders the board where the teachers can uh, show what really is important. They can also write uh, notes and they can decide with the classrooms and students or with a specific uh, student uh, can appear in the board and uh, they can share comments and teachers will write the comments. So the teacher says this is the comment and this is the note and I can erase, I can introduce, I can write it down. And later on I have the content part. Uh, usually all courses they have contents. The most interesting part is that we created a menu to create several units. I can create a unit here, there, I can change the order, I can change the name of the topic. And also I can filter, I can see all the units that I have. If I click on unit two, I will only see unit two. I have direct access to navigate. We improved a lot in navigation and also the tasks, the part. So the work that I have to make, it is separated from different units. And after this, uh, well, I have uh, different direct accesses or course contents that I wanted to introduce that are cross-related, such as like a firm that will take the whole course or tasks that I have to finish by the end of the year and also the virtual classrooms uh, with the big blue button links you create resources everywhere in a much more agile manner uh, much easier than the visual uh, scheme that Moodle has uh, much easier and also it's very interesting here you will see uh, the single sign on integration, which is a single logging for everything. And amongst the tools, you can see that they are interrelated and interlinked. If I want to create a task, sorry, give me a second. I'm going to 
I'm going to create a file and I'm going to create it directly in Nextcloud. Okay, I'm not going to upload it from my computer, but I can create it from this upload. And here I can see the authentication and I directly, I can get in Nextcloud and I'm inside and I have everything created here and I can create a new folder and a template and etherpad and I can create it here and I can see the uh, points if I want to share only uh, with the group and uh, when I get in the next cloud um, see what from a course part yes the course edition in Moodle there is a button of course edition sometimes it's kind of uh, tricky here you have the edit button and the visualization changes in a radical manner and uh, you are uh, sure that you're changing the course and uh, the content but what happens well we uh, uh, my uh, school uses classroom that's very easy you want to import all the courses from classroom and DD you click on this button here and uh, here it tells you how it works it's so easy you can click on next and here you need a Google account and then the password would be oh gosh Yes, it's me. I'm Pau. Well, the first thing that Google is asking from Classroom are the, all the permits that I have to give it to have access to my account. So I need to offer all the information. I say allow. And here you have all the uh, content that I created in my Classroom board. I can click on English. Uh, here I can pick all of them, or just one, or two, or three. I can click on the content. All right, it says the course creation is done. Here you can see the links, and here I have a Well, here I have the portal and everything, and here I can see the English class and course that it didn't exist before. And inside you have a note that was left by the teacher. The classroom is going to be very funny and has the same structure of the DD. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. This is like a miracle, miracle. Interoperability, we talked a lot about it in uh, uh, Europe, and it's a right and so, so forth, but rights, if we don't practice, we lose it. And our work was to uh, make possible this interoperability and to import uh, all the uh, work that are inside the Google Classroom. So a very big applause because this is amazing. Well, the challenge that we see, as I mentioned before, is that uh, there are some standards in the educational techniques that, that really make the connection between apps. Unfortunately, there are some corporations that uh, globalize the, the market and uh, they do not like standards. And uh, as you can see, you can understand that through one of these tools can be tricky and complicated but it's possible. Well, here you have uh, some notes that are interrelated with all the apps. I have a new activity because inside the English course I have a new activity and here I have this note. I do have uh, comments with uh, my students uh, from Moodle part. I'm going to skip it. Well, uh, so uh, as for the workshops, I'm going to try to skip the file part 
and I couldn't get in through the login because it was done through Moodle and I have a Nextcloud installation, very powerful, I can upload any kind of document. With schools we are uh, moving uh, all the documents from the repository, uh, we are installing here the sharing, it's much more powerful, I can share the link, I can decide how many times you can have access to the link, I can openly access the link if you don't have the plus, yes, these are the tools that I can create. This is a spreadsheet, a presentation, we all have a different document templates and it's very easy to create and you can create whatever, and also we have the leather pad, ether pad is there and well, this is the practical part and once I click on a text document, it opens the only office, which is the system that we selected. And uh, the uh, edition uh, capacities are bigger than the ones that we can see from other tools. It's collaborative, uh, so if two people write on the same time, you can see what they are writing. So it's everything that we need right, for a content edition. As for interoperability, Let's go uh, to the webs. Let's go to the web. Yes, the web part. It's very interesting. We integrated uh, WordPress. Uh, WordPress that creates uh, for each uh, and every school a multi-site WordPress. And we create a new uh, specific website for the teachers that are creating this website. So it's very interesting if you work on a project. So each and every classroom will have its own website and students they can share their contents in a very friendly user friendly manner because uh, WordPress is very easy very easy to use and you can also have a public website you can control everything from this part and suddenly we have another button to import a site from Google Sites this is another format that in theory cannot be imported or exported that it's sometimes very captive and we are working uh, to import sites in not in a complete manner but in big part the uh, design it's uh, useless because the design of Google site belongs to them but you have all the content and you can change it through WordPress yes we wanted to simplify uh, through Moodle and WordPress and many others we simplify everything to just leave the essentials and leaving a door open for those that want to use it in a very basic manner uh, like a big tech you can do it because we simplified everything and if you want more complexity well you can also uh, add more features the same that you can find in Moodle or WordPress so in order to import, it's very easy. You can write the URL and you write it, you put the name of the website and the language and once we import, well, suddenly it's kind of magic because you it takes five minutes, sorry. Well, it's a Chrome that it's a program every five minutes, but anyway, so it's a pending, the import state. I don't understand what you what are you saying? It's not in the the content. Oh yes, yes. Once you create a website, you don't need to have immediately a website, right? But it's not something that you uh, create uh, on a daily basis. You can set up. You you can create your classroom, and also well, as for the WordPress part, if we add a website. You have the different options and a different uh, blueprints uh, that and templates that uh, you can use, like uh, video collections, events, any kind of things. And the only data that we need are the URL, the title of the website, and the language. Yo mm, creo que. Ah, sí.
in the project there is an important task he has developed a very important task to be able to import and export groups first all the users to upload it automatically to create groups that can be reproduced and transferred very easily and that increasingly facilitate or facilitate even more um, to what you're used to in big text and this can be adapted in many ways this is the part of user management that we mentioned before the users groups are all here then there's the part of um, customization this is just to make the menus customized and the logo the image and the background and in the part of users what we have here is a csv file an excel file and also i think it's here this is to create but where can we see the type of file or document well anyway basically it also accepts Google format so the JSON file of Google that you have with all the list of groups and users that's also accepted and if you upload it here you have everything created the way it is in uh, Google do you like it I think this is fabulous. I am an ignorance with this, so I'm super surprised and stricken. But basic question, how can we convince our schools now? Um, how difficult is this technically speaking? And also, what are the resistances that you have an experience with and that you have had to overcome? We will talk about all this now. Just a moment, please. One sec. Hold on. Thanks for the enthusiasm. I share it. But let's Alex speak. Um, he's been coming from very long, from very long way. Um, he's been quiet for a long time. So let's hear from him, and then we will go into all that. He is Alexander Free Software Foundation. And when we told him we were doing this, he wanted to come along, and he's here. And Let's hear from him. Okay, yes. Super short um, to have time to answer your questions. I said uh, I'm coming from the Free Software Foundation Europe, and we are um, since more than 20 years trying to empower users to control technology and um, by the help of free software. And today, this empowerment uh, of controlling technology would be called digital sovereignty or something like this. But um, however, we are working on this topic since 20 years and. Um, the major point about this is, and um, I think we heard a lot of um, arguments in the last um, two days, and uh, specifically today again, is um, um, yeah that we want to um, have values and um, and uh, we want to have um, to control the power. We want to have data protection. We want to have privacy and so on and so on. And we can have this only with free software. And uh, if we talk about free software also named um, open source, then we are talking mainly about the license. And the license is coming with four freedoms. So there are many licenses um, um, on the planet for free software, but all of these licenses come with four freedoms. And it's the freedom to use, to study, to share, and improve. And that's key. So I mean, you can use the software for any purpose without any restrictions. That's um, super cool. Uh, you can study the code, that uh, means it's transparent, so you can read it, you can see what the software is going to do. And this is good for data protection, but it's also good for research, for learning, for studying. Um, so you want to, know, uh, want to know what the software is going to do. And um, I mean, also you are free to use it in as many workstations as you want, so you can share it without any limitations, so you can give it uh, to any other um, uh, schools. So um, for example, you can use it in one school use it in another school just with a um, different logo or something like this. And um, by, for example, just um, changing the logo, you are also somehow improving. So you are modifying the software, but also like um, what we've seen today, you are free to improve the software. And that's also 
I mean, very good. I mean, we all want better software, um, but by this improvement, you're also giving back to the community, and that's um, particularly very, very interesting because you are not only sharing and distributing software for one school, but what you improve at one school, you can also already use in another school at the same time, and that's, that's something which is not only good for schools, but it's good for our whole society. Um, I mean, users are you, me, uh, students, teachers, but also governments, right? And um, governments spend our money, it's taxpayers' money, and so that's why we also um, started a campaign like four years ago called Public Money, Public Code, and um, whenever governments, public bodies, administrations, schools, um, university, whomever wants to invest in software, yeah, then it should be released under a free and open source license. Um, because by thus we can um, reuse the code, we can um, reuse improvement, and we don't have to um, waste our money for licenses over and over again. And um, I mean, just to give you a, a small number, more than 27% of the revenue of software companies today is made by governments. And just imagine if we would invest this money into free software projects, I think our world our software world would um, look way better if we would invest this money into free software and um, this conference um, would have taken place maybe 10 years earlier or something like this. Yeah. And by that, so this is what I want to share with you. So um, it's our money, it's taxpayers' money, and um, it's about schools. And um, yeah, these improvements we, we are seeing here today will be available to everybody, not only to your schools, and that's, that's something what we like to empower with the Free Software Foundation Europe, so to empower this sharing, and that's why, um, yeah, we really love conferences like this and what you, are, what you guys are doing and um, that you are hosting conferences like this. So thanks, Simona. Thanks for doing this awesome project.